we have made um, quite a lot of progress since our first call um, a couple of years ago, I guess now, um, on what we were doing in terms of treatment. So just very, very quickly, we began live doing online real-time monitoring of different contaminants like arsenic, uh, mainly in the US. And the good thing about when you're doing real-time monitoring of treatment systems is you get a very good uh, insider's view as to how these systems don't necessarily work or meet the requirements of, of end users. And, um, and off the back of that, we decided that we could do better than the traditional technologies you will know very well uh, for treating contaminants like arsenic. Um, and uh, so we patented five years ago, seems like yesterday, a very different approach to uh, treating um, for things like arsenic, uh, which I'm going to introduce you to very briefly. Um, I'll, I'll keep it high level, but if you want to dive down into the chemistry, I'm happy to do that. And my colleague, uh, Patrick, is also on this call. Um, he's based out in Asia, and he's been very active um, on the ground um, in India the last uh, couple of months. Um, and he can update you as to where we actually are on the ground today. So um, that's by way of introduction. <clears throat> so why, you know, why do we need a better mousetrap or even a, something different to catch mice with? Um, the truth is that the there are some very well understood known technologies out there for dealing with arsenic. And this sort of doesn't matter whether it's a big well or a small well. You've got essentially reduction coagulation filtration, which is the use of ferric chloride or ferrous sulfate. It's an ugly, ugly chemical. Um, it's got co-contaminants, as we'll see in a minute. And um, it's been uh, subject to substantial price inflation in the last two or three years, what hasn't. Uh, however, what that has done is expose supply chain um, problems. And then the alternative, which you'll perhaps be more familiar with, um, is some form of filtration and reverse osmosis has generally been the go-to. <laughs> and um, you'll be aware, I'm sure, of the... Um, so the problem with filtration is it basically takes out whatever you're chasing and produces it collects it in a much more concentrated form that something has to be done with. So you're not actually treating the arsenic, you're just capturing it in a in a more concentrated form, along with a lot of other things um, by the nature of... Yes, um, yeah. Um, and associated with that, so you've got to deal with what happens to the waste stream. And that I know is a big issue in, in India, there's lots of places, but India particularly. Um, you've got the energy cost, dependency on... Um, availability of energy uh, lots of interferences get in the way and compromise performance um, and the need for additional chemicals so um, all of those are pretty some sort of big negatives and then there's some generic challenges um, latency means that lots of wells stop start and the problem is that if you have high latency it's a, between stopping and starting again um, the water produced will not be compliant. Uh, and so, um, and that's the problem. How do you control that? So for a period of time, people are going to get non-compliant water. Obviously, um, skilled labor, space, and overall the carbon footprint. So th though that's why we decided something better was required. There was a need. Here's the need. And so we have um, developed, patented, and now are into um, manufacturing. Um, an in situ reagent generation system. And uh, to give you some sense, there's you probably see on the black boxy thing on the left side, that's the electronics and controls. Uh, there's a meter rule on the uh, standing up against. So you can see that this is probably a five feet tall type of thing. And next to it is the generator. So this is, um, think of a battery, it's like an electrolytic cell in which are located um, in this case, um, certified steel plates. Um, one of the attractions of India is there's lots of certified steel in India, and we electrolyze that to produce um, ferrous, well, ferric ions, uh, which then do the uh, do the chemistry. So that is the technology. I, I refer to it as very high tech, low tech. It's low tech in the sense is we're using electrolysis, uh, but we have automated it 
um, in order that this process can be autonomous. It doesn't need to have someone looking after it. Um, that screen on the front means that, that that screen could be seen from anywhere, uh, whether it's in California or at a central area where, and it shows what's going on in the um, in the electrolyzer. So I'm gonna dive a bit more into technology in a second, but I just wanted to sort of position it for you. And um, it's NSF certified. So it's good for drinking water, which is very important. So um, this technology, um, I'm gonna to focus today on arsenic very briefly on chrome, which is also a problem in India, but it can treat a very wide range of contaminants. And I've only listed a few here. Um, uh, and we can cut, if anyone's interested in things like hydrogen sulfide or iron or man mercury or manganese, uh, we can talk about that maybe offline, but today we're gonna to focus on arsenic. So this is a very, very um, flexible, uh, treatment technology. In fact, if you think about what would you use ferric salts for, um, ferric chloride, ferrous sulfate, um, or ion exchange, these are the sort of contaminants that you will be thinking about using those approaches for. So we've just found a different way of um, using established chemistry. We didn't invent chemistry uh, to treat these contaminants. <clears throat> and essentially what we're doing um, is electrolyzing uh, in this case, uh, certified steel plates uh, to produce um, ferrous and then ferric. And um, these are very, very powerful reagents um, uh, in their um, ionic form. And uh, the chemistry, as I've said before, is very well understood. The uh, Some of you may be thinking, oh, this is uh, electrocoagulation. It is, it is the chemistry of electrocoagulation without the defects of electrocoagulation, um, which revolve around um, the, loss, the um, passivation, the coating of the plates, uh, which reduces the effectiveness of the system. And we found a very clever way of getting around that. I'll come to that in a second, which means that the defects of electrocoagulation don't apply here. So uh, just to address that up front. So what do we do? And this is you know, um, uh, sort of conceptual layout. We take, um, we have the influent coming from the well and the well can be of any size, any size. Um, and we take a very small side stream, less than 1% of that stream. And we pass it through the generator that you saw on um, the cell uh, the figure that was off to the right on that first slide. And uh, uh, we pass that through the generator and that produces a very, very concentrated form of um, uh, ferrous, um, uh, 5,000 ppm, that order of magnitude, um, convert to ferric. And then we bring that back in to the mainstream and now we're into the standard reduction coagulation filtration process. So essentially what we've done is replaced entirely the supply of bulk chemicals and the supply chain and everything that goes with it. And that reagent generator works on, it can work in two ways. It can work on demand um, with no latency, back to one of the problems of um, I mentioned earlier, but um, the ferrous reagent can also be stored for an extended, very extended period of time. So this unit requires very low power electricity. Um, so it can be regenerated using renewable energy. And, um, and then an excess produced and stored. Um, so when the sun's not shining, that reagent can then be used to maintain the uh, treatment process. So essentially the stored reagent becomes a battery for renewable energy, if that makes sense. Um, and then the, um, so we produce the reagent, brought into the contactor and we follow the standard process that you would follow if you're using ferric chloride, um, bulk uh, filtration and then, and then the effluent. The, um, in the filtration process, the arsenic is bound up uh, with the ferrous as it would be if it was ferric chloride. Um, you go through um, uh, the contactor 
and uh, the um, the sludge drops out and is removed. It is completely harmless, so it can go for landfill. So again, that would be the process you would follow with ferric chloride anyway. Um, so we're removing, the important point there is that we are removing the arsenic and rendering it um, immobile. So we're not taking out arsenic and then having to worry about what we're gonna do with the arsenic we've taken out. It's completely bound up uh, with the ferrous. The chemistry of um, ferric chloride, as I said. Does any, uh, that's quite a poor sort of slide in terms of principles of operation, what have you. Does, is everyone comfortable with that? Any questions? If anyone oh. has a question, you can raise your hand or unmute and just speak. I, well, I think you should continue. Uh, it's very interesting. I think Hari has. Oh, yeah, that's, sorry, uh, it's you. Yeah, I thought it was Raj. Yeah, Rick. No, I'm saying what you said on the ECT aspect uh, and how this is not ECT while it all comes. We'll come to that and I'll have some. I think you should complete your uh, uh, whatever, you know, your trajectory. And at the end of it, we'll have some. I'm sure okay. there are other people here like Mr. Gopal and others who will have some questions. The other one is when you talk of power, you need to tell us. You said very low power. So, and then you're saying it could even be solar driven. So, how mm -hmm. much is that? You know, when you are we talking one, two kilowatt? Or what is the you know peak load that you're talking it's, about? It, so, the um, it's driven. So, good, great question. So, the um, it's driven by uh, Faraday's law. So, the amount of uh, um, power we need is directly proportional to the amount of iron that we need to produce. Which exactly. is directly and, and then you said five thousand ppm that it can take up yes. to ferrous, right? Yes. So you see, in most but, cases on the Gangetic Basin, for instance, in sorry, uh, Rick, I'll finish this. Uh, uh, north of Calcutta, there is a place where we are having about seven hundred fifty ppm as count iron, right? There is Chandrasekhar here, Chandra from Watson. He also has some similar challenges on iron in some certain districts of India that he is working in. Anyway, over to you, Rick. Okay. But yeah, you're talking about about a kilowatt hour, um, which is well within, um, I mean, it's a light bulb. Um, so what this is now, uh, we did a very extensive um, evaluation at a very large uh, treatment plant here in the USA. Size doesn't matter, but it gave us an opportunity to deploy uh, our treatment system alongside uh, a ferric, bulk ferric chloride system. Okay. Okay. And, and and so and this was run over a pretty extensive period of time. Um, I've just captured part of the data here. Um, and there are a couple of very important things. So this is the effluent after treatment. Mm -hmm. OK. And, and we wanted to see, firstly, how did it perform against? And what this shows is that we were able to um, perform at least as well. In fact, it looks better, the blue line. Uh, than ferric chloride, but to the or uh, but with a thirty percent lower dose of iron. So that's quite important in terms of efficiency um, and everything else. But what's most important, or as important, um, is that ferric chloride, when it arrives, you cannot control the pH. You get what you get, and. Any of you who have been involved in arsenic treatment will know control of pH is absolutely essential to the effectiveness of removal. And because we are taking a side stream, we can control within the generator the pH very, very tightly. You can't do that with ferric chloride because you've got this huge volume that you're adding. But because we are doing this within the generator, we can control the pH. So we were able to control the pH to precise, I think it's 7.2 uh, to 7.4, it's that tight. We're able to control the pH within the generator and in that green block, that's where we were controlling the pH tightly. So we were able consistently, and if I had more data, I could show it to you, to remove arsenic to below 5 ppb, which is, and we all know that the EPA limit or Indian limit, whatever regulatory limit is 10. 10 is an artificial number. It's a number picked because that's the best that all of those technologies could do because of the limitations. So, and the world health goal is zero. Any level of arsenic is, an, is too high. 
question is how can you treat to um, what level can you treat to? So we are able to consistently treat to below five PPB, which in terms of general health, also changing the regulatory limits, is a huge step forward. So I just want to leave those. Those are two very important points. The efficiency of the system, and I'll come explain some of that in a second, but this control of pH and being able to treat below five PPB is a quantum leap in arsenic treatment. The one thing that very few people appreciate is when you buy ferric chloride, you think you are buying iron plus hydrochloric acid or um, sulfuric acid if it's the ferrous sulfate. That's, and if you read the can, the labels, uh, the, the data sheets, it will give you the concentrations of those uh, two chemicals, 